Uh, hello, everyone. How's it growing? <laughs> uh, I'm Rick Kessler from uh, Way Beyond. Uh, Way Beyond, we help load and make tech islands uh, improve their production and their quality through integrated AI uh, solutions. And behind that, we have a team of uh, excellent economists, and AI scientists and data scientists that help us produce those tools. And we've also helped um, do this analysis that I'm going through today. So uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'll take you through, um, I'll present the case for a holistic approach to your forecasting and planning management. Uh, we'll start with, is chasing really highly accurate yield prediction the right approach? Um, yield swings, what are they? We're the yield prediction killer. Uh, and then finally, what can we take away from uh, this analysis in augmenting of greenhouses? So to start off with, uh, yield prediction is a really great tool and it helps us understand what's going to happen in um, the coming weeks, helps us plan, helps us make sure that we're going to meet our goals and our targets. But how does it actually work? If we're using an AI-empowered yield prediction, um, we give the model a lot of historical data, it finds patterns within that historical data, and then it uses those patterns that it's found to try to find patterns in your current data and predict what's going to happen next. But there is challenges with that approach. Uh, firstly, it requires a vast amount of historical data. Not every grower has the data that's required, particularly the low to mid-tech growers that we work with. They might just be starting on their digital transformation journey. They might not have all the different types of data that are required. Or, for example, if you just implemented a new variety, say a disease-resistant variety, the patterns that are in your data from other varieties might not apply to um, in your current variety. Secondly, so the data is not always available. It might be siloed in a database somewhere. It might be on Excel spreadsheets. It might be on some paper in someone's drawer. Getting it all together is quite difficult sometimes. Um, changes in climate and weather patterns. We heard this morning that that is a big issue that's coming through. Um, even for some of our growers, say that the data they have from three years ago not necessarily usable today because there's certain differences in um, how plants respond to the environment. Uh, and then finally, the biggest one, there is variable accuracy in yield prediction week to week. Some weeks it's predicted that you're going to get 70 kgs and harvest 70 kgs. Some week it's predicted you're going to get 70 kgs and you only harvest 20. So yield prediction in that case is not that useful. And you only find that out until after you've actually done the harvesting for that week. Um, so when that happens, it's not so useful. So the question is, is aiming for really highly accurate yield prediction in the right approach um, considering those challenges that we see. Is it even feasible to get 95 to 100% accuracy every single week consistently based on what we've said? Um, we don't really think so. So I'm going to present a case for a holistic approach where we use yield prediction as a really useful tool alongside tools that allow us to have insight about the environment, the plant themselves, and management practices so that we can have a more robust understanding of what's going to happen in the few weeks and we can decrease the risk of having weeks where your pressure doesn't actually get it right. Um, so we first asked, when we see these uh, weeks with low accuracy on your pressure, what else are we seeing? Um, up here you'll see a representation of a typical um, crop cycle, where the blue line is your actual harvested yield week to week. The red dotted line is a very loose approximation of um, a yield budget and a very loose approximation of an yield prediction. Uh, and those red dots highlight weeks where you've produced significantly more or significantly less than the expected in front of the yield prediction. And those weeks we're going to call yield swings um, and go on from that. So we hypothesize that uh, when you have low accuracy yield prediction, you're going to see a lot more of these yield swings in your data. So we went through and uh, did yield prediction on 20 full crop cycles of tomato data. Uh, and for each of those crop cycles, uh, we've got the accuracy ranges um, for all the weeks and grouped into three groups. First one is the highest accuracy group, where the accuracies range from 89 to 95% for a crop cycle. Um, second highest, where they range from 85 to 89, sorry, set accuracy. And the third or lowest accuracy group, where it ranged from 80 to 85. And as we hypothesized, um, we went through and looked at how many yield swings were each of those cycles, and we found that as accuracy decreases, the number of yield swing weeks increases. So what that suggests is the less um, the less consistent your growing practices are, the more uh, the less useful and less accurate the yield prediction is going to be. Uh, that's interesting, particularly for our low to mid tech growers, um, where getting highly consistent 
um, growing practices might be more challenging than if you're in a grass cows than you've ever before. And, um, so does that mean that yield prediction is always going to be less useful for growers who have less consistent practices and they're constrained by different things? Uh, well, no, we don't think so. Because if we understand what's causing those yield uh, swing weeks or what factors lead to yield swings, then we can start to uh, mitigate the risk of those and increase our consistency and increase the usefulness of our yield prediction. So we went through, in order to do that, we went through eight weeks before each of the yield swing weeks we found in data, and we looked at the environmental data. So first off, looking at uh, swing weeks where we've produced significantly less, this is what we found. Um, so the most common thing, the most common factor that we found in the previous eight weeks before a low swing week is low outside night temperature. That's kind of interesting because we're in a protected environment, so why does um, the low outside night temperature have such an effect on a bee's low swing weeks? It's also something that we can't control, we can't control outside. Um, so just kind of understanding that and being able to say, well, I know in the next few weeks we're going to have outside temperature, that gives me a risk of producing the mess than I expect. Low total light, that makes sense. Less energy for plants, you can reduce less. Um, low internal day and night temperature difference. So that is if you've got 15 degrees during your day, 16 degrees your night, a lot of difference between the two. Um, so we can start to build a picture of risk factors for having less than we get to produce. We did the same for high swing weeks, we reduced it even more. And what we found was that in the eight weeks prior to those, the most common factor that we saw was high internal daylight temperature difference. So like the low swing week, if, you, if your difference between your pay temperature and your night temperature is really large, that means you've got a risk of having a swing week where you can produce more in your respect. Uh, outside night temperature, outside of June, something to be aware of, not something we control. Um, and high total light, again, something that makes sense, the more light you have, the more energy you pass them on that element of juice. Uh, so, Kind of those are environmental factors, but the environment for the only thing that influences what we produce. Uh, so we also looked at the impact of our biology on swings. Uh, we specifically looked at these measurements, truss height, weekly growth, reef length, stem weight, and leaf numbers. And the reason we looked at those measurements specifically is because they were a great representation of you know, plant state, whether it was vegetative or generative, we were spending some energy on producing uh, more leaves and stem leaves versus producing them fruit. What we found was in eight weeks before a low swing week, the plants spent more time being vegetative, spending energy on leaves, than it did being generative. And before a high swing week, your plants spend more time being generative than it did being vegetative. That makes sense, but it's good to see the cool data and data. And what we can do now is we can say there's multiple risk factors here. And for example, in the eight weeks coming, we're seeing high outside uh, temperatures, we're seeing the plant being very generative we've got risk factors for producing more than we expect or more than our yield production might tell us we never produce. What we could do with this is we could say, maybe um, we want to take advantage of this or take advantage of market pricing where it's part of a little more expensive, we want to lean into it, maybe we push our part to be even more visible. Maybe we use other things like um, increase the difference between our day and night temperature um, to increase the factors that are able to produce more um, production. Or we want to do the opposite. We want to offset some of this risk, make it more consistent, so we push our plant to be a little bit more general, uh, vigilant based on our factors. So, what does this mean for tomorrow growth when we take back into the greenhouse? Um, so the first thing is yield prediction is an amazing tool. It's really helpful, but it's made even better when we understand context and use other tools to get context about what these um, risk factors are for growing off course um, when our production. Uh, we should reconsider the quest for 95 to 100 percent meal production accuracy. Might be a little bit controversial, uh, but should we spend our time trying to get super highly accurate meal production, or should we spend it on trying to understand the factors that cause our meal production to be worse, the things that cause our swings to happen, uh, and we get some more uh, consistent production? Uh, some practical advice: investigate your yield swings. Um, so if you do have a week where you produce significantly more than your tips. Uh, maybe go back and look at that previous eight weeks. Do you see anything that um, correlates you what we found in the lab we've processed as well? Um, and then finally, plant staining is a really important indicator of swings. Um, so if you're not taking phenology measurements, uh, now's a great time to start. Um, and keep an eye on where the plants are um, using to do for Jerov. 
I think that is it for me. Um, we've got a white paper coming out that has all this data um, and some other analysis. So if you want to get a copy of that, um, feel free to give me an email or catch up after the show. Um, and if you want to have a chat, ask any questions, feel free to uh, catch me afterwards or we've got a few other colleagues sitting in here as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Luke.